The world is telling us as men to be common, to fall in line, to fall short of any visions or plans God has for us. But what about being uncommon? This is a movement of men seeking to build an eternal legacy, a journey of men on mission to rise above the common, to experience sustainable life change. This is Uncommon Disciple. Welcome to the Uncommon Disciple podcast. My name is Michael Bowen, and with me as always is Jared Gibson. Hello. And our very special guest, Pastor Caleb Schroeder. What's up, Caleb? Hey, how are you guys doing? It's great to be on here. Absolutely. It's good to have you. And this is our first uh, our first shot at a remote podcast. So uh, so we're just prayerful that everything will go through smooth. But uh, I wanted to introduce everyone to who you are and uh, and how you came to us. So you're the senior pastor of Faith Community Church, and uh, you've been walking with the Lord for a very long time. From what I've read at the age of six, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, you sensed the call into ministry when you were 11 years old. And then when we talked the last time, um, you also shared that you were a mathematics teacher at both the high school and college level for 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. I still am an adjunct at a community college. Just got to keep oh, my awesome. ass toe in the water. And so you came to us by way of, of Jared. Jared, yes. uh, Jared was uh, had grown up in Faith Community Church mm-hmm. and uh, kind of grew up under um, as your friend. Yeah. Right? It, 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 tell us the story, Jared. Yeah, yeah. So um, we so after my mom passed when I was uh, 13, we uh, because my brother actually was dating a girl that was going to faith community. And uh, there was, you know, a lot of hurt from the previous church and the stuff that had gone down um, after my mom's death. Um, so we switched over to that church mainly because my brother was dating uh, the girl there and we just kept going there. And um, I was friends with uh, another kid and uh, junior high and um, that friendship ended up going pretty sideways, really south. And some very hurtful things were uh, were said during that time. But uh, he ended up saying, hey, there's a guy named Caleb in the youth group. You guys have very similar sense of humor. Uh, you, you should probably start hanging out with them. And uh uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was basically after that we started, we just instantly clicked. We had the same goofy sense of humor, same movie taste. And um, that was kind of like the birth of the friendship. And then, uh, I mean, uh, Caleb was a huge rock uh, in my life, um, you know, with the abuse I was dealing with at home and how I was teetering between my faith and wanting to do stuff, you know, that would sinful. Um, and then. Um, Caleb had, uh, he started a Friday night Bible study, um, in his house. We went through like the book of James and things like that. And, uh, so now, I mean, Caleb was really interested. You remember that? Oh yeah. You remember the book? I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Dang Caleb. Yeah. <laughs> you, must have, you must have brought it that night or those nights. You know, that's a, a great name. We tried to memorize as much of it as we could. So that's the way it stuck in his head is we actually were trying to yeah. like, not only to study it, but we tried to memorize the whole book of James. I don't think any of us did it, but we worked on it. Yeah. No. You're like, yeah. count it all joy, my brethren. <laughs> you fall into various trials. <laughs> you know, Caleb's a great name. You know, my son is uh, named Caleb. And, you know, as I was um, praying through and, and thinking about this podcast, um, in retrospect, you know, I, I didn't grow up in faith. But the legacy that you and Jared bring to the table is something that uh, that that I admire, and and I wish I had it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I did have some a good a good group of guys um, early on when I came to faith. I came to faith late in my twenties, and uh, I had a good group of guys come around me, and and I grew up in you know in faith with them. But you were fairly young yeah. when uh, when you when you met Caleb, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you guys have a long standing history. Yeah. So you know you know all of Jared's dark deep secrets, <laughs> Caleb. <laughs> He shared most of them with you guys. So, oh, know, okay. yeah. Good, 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 good. <laughs> if you have any more you could think of, you know, the audience would love to hear those. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we had we had a lot of fun um, when we were in high school. I would spend time at Jared's house. Um, and I think that was the, the seeds of what he's doing now, because um, he loved to take his dad's video camera. Um, and we would uh, we would try to film special effects um, with no equipment, oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I would like I totally hide forgot about that. corners with like flour and he'd pretend like he's shooting and I'd like sh- throw the flour out to make it look like, you know, bolts are hitting the cement. And yeah. And then his dad would find out and that wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, wow. I, uh, 
His, his brother, by the way, is huge. Um, so I still have crooked teeth from playing basketball with him in their backyard on the basketball court when we were kids growing up. So lots of good yeah. times. Yeah. Jared's the one who introduced me to grits too. Uh, oh, he, that's he right. Did, he did all the cooking for his family. So I never had this, this thing before called grits. You know, I'm Southern California. What's this, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes. What is this? So yeah. he, introduced me to, <laughs> he introduced me to grits. Uh, and actually, I don't think I've ever had them since I had them. When, I don't know, we were like 15, 16 years old. And Jer- Jer- Man, he I was, love grits. He was like, you know, Susie Homemaker. He did all the work in his house. He did like all the laundry and like cooked yeah. and all that stuff. So um, I, was, I was really independent. So I just sort of would go wherever. Um, and so I'd ride my bike over to his house. Um, we actually live in separate cities, but I sort of made my way around and we just hang out. Um, yeah, those are, those are good memories. Well, I feel like I missed out. We had a home group over at Jared's house, uh, last week and I was thinking, I wish I would have had some grits, man. <laughs> I know. Kind of like make them. some chicken at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, now I know. Yeah. So I, I used grits. to put eggs in them and cheese and oh yeah. <laughs> Cause they you know, Caleb, have um, no flavor. So you have to put something in it. <laughs> exactly. You, you have to throw something. Oh, in yeah. It. You got to put stuff in there. You know, hot sauce, butter, yeah. you know, salt, pepper, all the good <laughs> stuff. You know, J- um, Caleb, when we talked the last time, um, you know, one thing I was excited about was, you know, you, you grew up in faith and you have this, this, faith story that I want, you know, I want, obviously want you to share, but you know, what I'd really like you to speak to um, this afternoon is, you know, talking to guys about like, you can be a, a man and be a man of faith, mm-hmm. right? You can do guy things and still be a man of faith. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things I was, uh, you know, I was excited for you to talk about again is uh, like your bachelor party, right? That was, that was something funny and cool that you go, I didn't know guys of faith had fun like that. <laughs> right. So, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that, but can you give us some backdrop to how you grew up in faith and what that looked like and, and how you transitioned into the senior pastor role? Yeah. Um, so I, I was raised, um, with the dad who took discipling his sons seriously. Um, I'm one of nine children. Um, I have five brothers and three sisters. Um, and, my, my dad was, he had the gospel on his lips all the time. He had scripture on his lips all the time. Um, and he, he spoke scripture to us. Like it was life. He didn't speak scripture to us. Like, uh, you need to get your act together. He spoke scripture to us to remind us of who we are in Christ. Um, Mm. and just growing up, hearing that constantly, um, just cements your identity. Like I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. Um, I have the Holy Spirit. He's going to help me through this trial. Like my dad, when he would discipline us, he would remind us of that. Um, mm. And and it was one, one of the blessings I have is is multiple generations of faith in my family. So my grandpa, my grandfather um, was a pastor. And um, when I was when I was born, he had retired from the pastorate and he was doing other jobs. He he worked at a, a big church out here, um, but he uh, he'd take me out. And, um, I'd work with him. He'd teach me a, a lot about carpentry and just working on, uh, maintaining his rental houses, you know? Um, but he just teach me lessons as we're doing it. So I had modeled for me, I had men pouring into me from a very young age, um, who were teaching me what it means to be a man of Christ, to walk, um, in the word. And that's, that, that's so, that's such a blessing. I, I didn't realize what I had, um, until I sort of got older and I realized, oh, wow, you know, other guys didn't have this, you know, like I, I go to Jared's house and, um, we're having to convince his dad to let him come to church with me. You know, and I was like, what, mm. what is this? This is, doesn't make sense. How, what is going on here? I, I couldn't calculate that because I was surrounded, um, with men of faith. And as I got older, I sort of, um, started worrying about it a bit. I was like, you know, um, to whom much is given much is expected. Like God, God's given this to me as a gift. He, he expects a return on that, you know, like the parable of the talents He gives more talents. He's going to expect more from you. Um, and there, there's definitely times where I'd feel sort of overwhelmed with my legacy, feel blessed by it. But then I, I began to, to learn that, um, you know, who the Lord calls, he equips and who he, when he begins a good work in you, he's going to be faithful to complete it. Um, and so I just sort of tr- started trusting him with my tomorrows. I sort of like started creating these ideals in my head of like what I was supposed to do because he blessed me in this way. And so I'm going to do these things for you. And, and I realized I started, started trying to get ahead of God. Um, and God mm-hmm. really for, for a long time in my life had to, had to humble me, um, had to, had to teach me, you know, wait for me. No, 
Like it's my, it's my plan. It's my time. Um, wait for me. Um, and those were, those are just a blessing to learn. This worry and burden that you had to live up to, to what God had, you know, had called you to do and, and this legacy that, that you grew up in. Um, was there any, um, was there any worry or fear that you wouldn't live up to the expectations of grandpa and dad? Yeah, definitely. Um, my, my, my dad and my mom would just tell me all the time, you know, God has a plan for you, Caleb. Um, God's given you things to use for his kingdom. Um, and what was interesting is, um, I, when I was 11, I felt called to the ministry, but specifically, specifically international missions. Um, and my parents didn't feel that they were like, no, we don't think that's what it is. Um, and they gave me a lot of pushback and I pursued that and God closed the door for that. Do you think it was selfish pushback? Like, Hey, we don't want you to get married and we won't be able to see our grandkids. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like my, my dad now, he says like, I knew you were going to be a pastor and that's why I don't want you to be a missionary. And I mean, you're doing the same thing. It's just, you're pastoring in a foreign context, you know, your, your church planning in a foreign context. Um, I think that they knew, um, I think the spirit had just revealed to them, um, that God was preparing me, um, for ministry here, uh, in the U S they're really not, um, they're really willing to sacrifice anything. Um, e even now it's ironic. Like, um, I have, I have six kids myself, um, bunch of my siblings still live here in the AV and my parents are in Texas. So, you know, if they wanted me to stay here so they could be close to their grandkids, they didn't, they didn't do it right. Um, I live across the street from the house that I grew up in. Um, and that they still own the house, but they don't spend any time there. So I, I don't think it's a matter of keeping me close by because they, they go where the spirit leads and they want their kids to do the same thing. That's awesome. You know, as we got to know each other on, uh, on our previous call together, you know, I was really impressed with how grounded you are, um, not only as a pastor, but, you know, as a dad of six kids. And I wondered, you know, your dad was an elder in the church. Was that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what was his vocation, um, you know, his day job? He was a, he was a school teacher. Um, and actually that was, that was neat for me. Um, I thought I was supposed to go into full-time ministry and, um, I, I ended up going to a state school, so I didn't get a Bible degree for my undergraduate. And, um, and I did that because I believed if God wanted me to go to a private Christian school, he'd provide the funds and a program got canceled that had provided a scholarship for me. And all of a sudden the scholarship wasn't there and it was $10,000, which was a lot in, you know, the two early two thousands. Um, so I ended up going to a state school cause that was free. And I got out and mission boards were like, you don't have any Bible school. Um, you can't, we, we're not going to support you. You can't come on. Yep. Um, and so I went into the public schools and I was like, I'm going in as missionary. I'm going to go to the public schools. I'm going to be a missionary there. But the first school that hired me was the same one my dad worked at. So my dad mm -hmm. was my master teacher. Um, we taught side by side at the same high school, um, for 15 years, like our doors faced wow. each other. Um, and so he continued to pour into me as a professional, you know, I can remember like, if he, if he was leaving work before me, he'd come into my classroom and stick his head in my classroom and say, Hey, Caleb, go home. Your family needs you. I'd be like, dad, I got to grade these papers. You know, I got to take care of it tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Your family needs you. Um, and he had that longevity to realize, you know, what was important. And so for 15 years, having that in my life, just like go home, focus on your family. Um, that was a blessing. Like, I don't know if you ever worked with a godly man who could just really challenge you to not take your work too seriously, but that was a huge blessing for me. Yeah, I had asked the question because a lot of guys make excuses for why they don't have time to disciple their kids, right? But your dad worked a normal job, right? Mm -hmm. Nine to five, basically Monday through Friday, but still found time to be intentional about your faith. Yeah. And not only you, all your brothers and sisters. Yeah. So what did family devotions look like? I mean, that give us a, a you know, a, a peek into what that looked like for your family. It's interesting. Recently, my dad told me... Um, you know, that he wished he would have been more consistent about family devotions. Um, mm. my dad was, it was just constant. It was a constant conversation, never ended. So he didn't really spend a lot of time formally sitting down with us. It would just be like, we'd be like at dinner and we'd be having fish. And my dad was a biologist. That's what he taught, he taught biology. And he'd be talking about how God designed the fish that we're eating, you know, <laughs> like showing us the different parts of it and explaining, you know, why it was so essential that God designed it that way and how it couldn't happen any other way. And he's just like in awe of God, right? Um, we'd be like hiking. We live close to a 
Mount Whitney here in California. We'd spend our summers there and just, just pointing out everything as we're hiking that's just glorifying God around us. And his, his speech was just constantly seasoned with scripture. Um, my dad carries a new Testament with him wherever he goes. Um, and he's done that for as long as I can remember. And he's, my dad has like, um, he's in his sixties, but he has like ADD and he's had hardcore ADD his whole life. And so he can't mm. not be doing something. But what that means is he has the word out. So he's in the line at this grocery mark, he's reading the word, and then he's just sharing with us what he's reading. So it wasn't a lot of like, okay, everybody, let's sit down. Let's read the Bible together. It was just, this is what we talked about all the time. This is, this is who we were. So it was just, um, spiritual conversations were just the norm. It set the culture of your house. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, my mom was the same way. She was somebody who was just constantly, um, speaking God's word, um, to us, just reminding us of God's word. She probably, you know, um, I was homeschooled K through 12, um, along with most of my siblings. And so she would, you know, read scripture to us during the school day. He would spend time doing that. Um, but, um, not a lot of just like formal sit down. Let's read through. Bro, your mom's a champ. She homeschooled all you guys. <laughs> oh man. My mom is a saint. She's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Jared, Jared and I are laughing because we have trouble just homeschooling our few kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the crazy thing is like when you have a, when you have a large family, um, it sort of homeschools itself. Um, so like mm, uh, I'm, it. I'm the third. And so the older siblings would help out a lot with the younger siblings. And ironically, the first four of us all went into education. And I think it's because that's what we're doing all the time. We're teaching our younger siblings, helping them learn to read, helping them do their lessons. And um, really, you learn at a higher level when you're teaching somebody else. So that would, it, it helped us, it helped them. And it was a, it was a blessing. Yeah, so you graduate high school from, uh, from being homeschooled. Uh, you go into college. And, uh, and what, did you, what did you study in college? I studied math education. So not pure math, math specifically for education. Um, I went, I started out going to a community college. Um, and, uh, then I transferred to a uh, state school out here. Um, my wife and I were already, um, we were sort of an unofficial item when we were in college together. Um, so we were going to the community college together. Um, and then we got engaged right after we finished at the junior college. She went away to the, the master's college, which is now the master's university. And then I went to a yep. Cal State. Um, and so we were going to separate schools. And after a year, um, we got married between our junior and senior year of college. And then our first year of marriage, we're college students finishing it out. And, um, and I finished, I actually, it was in the middle of my senior year of college that I got offered a full-time position as a, as a math teacher at my dad's high school because um, I had a teacher leave in the middle of the year. Um, and so they brought me on. And um, the second year I was there, every teacher in the math department um, either retired or moved to a different school. So my second year, I was a senior teacher, um, uh. which meant like when you have seniority as a teacher, that means that you get to teach the advanced classes. So the whole time I was, I was teaching mathematics, I was teaching the honors classes, the, all the advanced math. And that was a huge blessing. I got to work with really um, gifted students. and um, it's, it's hard. Public education is really difficult, but if you can get into teaching the gifted students, that's just, it's, it stretches you intellectually, but it doesn't stretch you as much emotionally. Um, you don't have as many of the behavior issues that a lot of new teachers have in their classroom. So sure. I was really blessed that way. Let me ask you a question. How did you navigate, um, the public school system in your faith? I, you know, I think that's a big thing for, um, for not just people that are in that vocation right now, but also parents. You know, and, yeah. and even students. I know that, you know, our son Caleb is. Uh, our two girls are are homeschooled right now. Um, Caleb's going to go back to homeschooling next year, and then they're going to um, use the public school system for um, for activities, um, extracurricular, you know, sports and and whatnot, and um, basically their electives. Um, but you know, Caleb tells me how difficult it is, you know, for even sharing his faith in school. You know, he's on a sports team, and mm -hmm. you know you know, prayer time or anything else is, is kind of frowned upon. Uh, and we live in a fairly conservative uh, town here. Yeah. 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 So, um, my dad was, his approach to homeschooling was different than a lot of my peers. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I grew up, you know, in the eighties and homeschooling was not widely popular, but for whatever reason it was in our town. Um, we had a large, large group of homeschoolers, um, in the Allen Valley, um, which is 
Palmdale, Lancaster, where we live. So I was in Palmdale, Jared was in Lancaster. So we just called it the Antelope Valley. Um, yeah. But my dad didn't homeschool. He, he was, us. On the, was he on the other, the wrong side of the tracks then? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he lived in the ghetto but it's all right when i first got married I had a little <laughs> that's what i was waiting for you to say man yeah. you snuff your nose up a little oh, bit you know, it, it, got, it got bad though like yeah it was yeah. it was it was crazy my wife and i we bought some property um seven years ago we got out of the neighborhood we were in i mean like when i say ghetto i mean like helicopter shining the lights in your bedroom you know, like yeah. looking for people, dogs, you know, police dogs running through your yard, people jumping fences, you know, um, literally people they, being shot in the street. Um, yep. Drug dealers. Hey bro, we, in front of our your home group, yeah. we have, we have three, three couples from Lancaster. So yeah. I've heard a, quite oh, yeah. a few stories of, yeah. you know, uh, how um, the, the train like, drops all the prisoners off there. And, yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. It's interesting because it's um we have a we have that crime we have that overflow from LA yeah um, but we also have like a lot of conservative people in in mm-hmm. our area um like both of the congressmen that we've elected are very conservative congressmen here so our biggest like employer is um is our like it's called Plant Forty Two which is like Lockheed Northrop all the aerospace and all those engineers are more conservative. And um, we have a large Air Force base out here. So that's more conservative. We have a large mm-hmm. um, racetrack that uh, attracts more conservative people. So um, what kind of racetrack? Willow Springs Raceway. So one of the oh, first right. yeah. paved raceways created in um, in California. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. Um, so all, all of that, you know, it does. It, it makes an interesting culture here because um, you have those conservative pockets. But then, yeah, we do have all the crime and the poverty and, and all of those problems. Um, so navigating that, you know, the, again, working in the public school system yeah, and, so and your faith. When I was growing up, a lot of my peers, their parents would take them out of school because they were afraid of what the culture would do to their children. Um, mm. My dad homeschooled us because he believed academically he could do a better job than the schools were doing. Um, wow. And so he didn't really take us away from the culture. We did like all the city, like basketball teams. I played little league. We swam competitively on the city, like swim team. Um, and so we're, we're out there. And then my parents would challenge me. They'd be like, Caleb, you, you want to be a missionary? Who are you sharing the gospel with? You need to go share the mm-hmm. gospel with people. Um, and so, you know, I would, and like, they would let us go and spent, you know, like could go have a sleepover at other kids' houses. Whereas like, some of my homeschool friends, like their parents would never do that. They're like, that person's not a Christian and they go to public school. You know, you can't spend the night there. Um, yeah. My parents sort of, they're going to like, affect you. <laughs> yeah. And like my parents were like, you know what you believe, go over there and be a salt and light, you know? Um, yeah. And so because of that, when I got into the public schools, it wasn't like, oh no, you know, there's worldly people here who swear and have weird views on, you know, their sexuality and stuff. It's just like, this is this is why we're here. It it makes sense to me that slaves of sin obey their master. Um, that never really has freaked me out. Um, and I also my grandpa, who was a pastor, was his his spiritual gift was evangelism. And something he taught me was you got to love people to Jesus. Um, mm. And and honestly, I didn't I didn't navigate it well for the first couple of years that I was a school teacher. I was like trying to figure out like how do I how do I do a good job? And um, I was really focused on. Um, getting tenure and like providing for my family. And I wasn't really um, sharing the gospel with my students. I wasn't like um, doing a good job of making sure they knew I was a believer. Um, And God really convicted me of that after about, I think I've been teaching for five years. Um, And what happened is I, um, I coached cross country and track and field. Um, And at the end of track and field, Track and field, you know, you compete as a team, but at the end of the season, you can't have athletes go on individual events. Um, and I had this, this high jumper who was just exceptional. And he went all the way to the Masters, which is like um, almost to the state championship. Um, and I mean, I, I have no idea how to coach the high jump. You know, I just like would read books and tell him. So I'm trying to coach <laughs> this kid, but he's the only one. So I, I take him to the Masters championship, just the two of us. You know, I drive him there. He competes. Um, and we're driving home and this is a kid who, um, I'd had in my algebra two class, like all year. Um, he'd been in my class, real quiet kid. We really hadn't connected. I didn't know was what happened in his life. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew he was quiet and he barely, you know, pulled grades to get by and he could jump really high. Um, he also would hurdle like a maniac. 
Um, but so we're coming back. We stop at Carl's Jr. We get our food and it's just the two of us, you know, so we sit at a table together um, and I bow my head to pray for my food. Right. And I look up and this kid has a shocked look on his face. He's like, coach, I didn't know you were a Christian. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't tell you. And he's like, no, coach. He's like, I, I gave my life to Christ this year. And he's like, really? And he's like, yeah. And um, man, my moms have been ticked off. Um, as like your mom's, he's like, yeah, my moms are lesbian. And like, they've not been cool with me co- becoming a Christian. They've wow. been like, they'll kick me out and they're doing, and like, he just been suffering. He'd been going through it. And he would sit in my classroom every day for a year and like track, if you don't know, it's a spring sport. So this is May. This is the end of the year in May. I had one more week with that kid in my classroom. And I was like, man, God, I missed it. I missed it big time. Um, and so I would just make sure start of the year, kids knew who I was. They knew what I was about. You know, I'd, you introduce yourself as a teacher start of the year. Um, I started hope, hosting a Christian club for students in my classroom. Um, and I just started making sure I was having conversations, especially with my athletes, you know, um, like you can just, I, I just like use a Bible story as an illustration as I was coaching, you know? Um, and then I have kids ask me follow-up questions. And so I started seeing fruit. I started having kids come, um, and say, Hey coach, you know, what do I need to do to become a Christian? Like, I, like I describe it as fish jumping in your boat, you know, like Jesus says, yeah. I'm going to make you fishers of men, but then like who, who, who brings the fish to you? He does. And so I'd have kids come to me and just ask me to share the gospel with them. I'd have kids come to me and say, you know, Hey, Mr. Schrader, I know you don't agree with my lifestyle, but could you pray for me? I know that you're a man of faith. Can you pray for me? You know? Um, and I just, I tried to love my students and let them know where I was coming from. So they'd see that they'd see, Hey, this guy's a Christian and he loves us. And, and so it would provide opportunities for me to share with them. Um, and, and eventually a lot of those kids, I was able to, some of those kids, I should say, I was able to disciple and lead to the Lord. And, um, you just gotta, you gotta be out there. I wouldn't take the time, um, in my classroom. Like I wouldn't be like, okay, I was supposed to teach you guys math today, but today I'm going to preach to you. Um, from Romans chapter one, you know, I wouldn't do that. Um, but I would, I would love them and I would, I would keep my faith out there and I have conversations Mm -hmm. outside of the class time and God would constantly just draw kids to me and give me opportunities to share the gospel with them. I would like last lecture for my seniors every year. I would like, I would tie in the gospel, um, with mathematics for the very last lecture I would do every year. So, you know, that was like my last little thing, like, Hey guys, I want you to know this because it's the most important thing to me. And I don't know if I'm going to see you again. And I was at my school was a small rural school. So I'd have kids like three years in a row. So we get really close, you know, mm. so I use those opportunities. Well, I, you know, it just from the, what you're describing, it sounds like the fragrance of Christ just emanated from you in the classroom and it built that trust with kids. And it really encourages me when you tell me that the kids came up and said, hey, you might not agree with my lifestyle, Mr. Schroeder, but I, I'm asking for prayer. And a lot of times people are afraid to do that because we're so quick to judge people, right? Um, As Christians, before we even give them a chance, we're not to be judge. God's the judge, Yeah, right? We're there to love people and pray for them. Uh, And again, as God brings them in, as he brings the fish in, right? We're to, we're to do our best with the gifts that he's gifted us with to direct them back to Christ. And, yeah. um, and, and so that's, I mean, that's just so encouraging and, and really speaks to me, yeah. you know, even as we're, we're talking about this, because, you know, I can sometimes forget what, what our main purpose is when God says to go make disciples of all the nations, right? It doesn't mean that, that we just pick the ones that we want to minister to or disciple. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And the thing is something he's taught me is just walk circumspect, you know, um, that's, that's aware of. We need to be aware of our enemy, but we also need to be aware of the opportunities that God's providing for us, you know? So mm. just your head's on a swivel and you're, you're looking for those, for those people who, who need triage, you know, you need looking for those people who are hurting and you move towards them and you just love on them. You know, I was reading a quote from uh, Jim Elliott um, this today, and it reminded me of something that you had mentioned. You have a real, real heart's desire for, for men and discipleship. You know, I was meeting with our, I was telling Jared, I was meeting with our pastor and our assistant pastor yesterday for lunch. And, and I really shared with them the fact that I believe that, um, and, you know, in the coming years that God wants to use men to fire up the revival. Right. And, um, Jim Elliott had said this, he says, I have prayed for new men 
fiery, reckless men possessed by uncontrollably youthful passion. Mm. These lit by the spirit of God. And I know that you've got a real heart's passion and desire for men. And what does that look like, you know, as, as you pastor and, uh, and shepherd your church? And again, you live in California, so you're, Shepherding looked a lot different and difficult than than some of the churches here in the in the United States, you know, through uh, through the pandemic. And um, and so how do you how do you do that today and how do you encourage men and exhort them in their walk? You know, um, <clears throat> there's there's a couple of ways I do it. I'm blessed to have a, a men's ministry um, director at my church who's who's phenomenal with men. He really pours into our men um, and uh, and he's a man's man. So. That helps too, you know, like he makes knives as a side job um, and he, he's a pilot, you know, so he flies planes and, and does all those things. Um, but one of the things that we do is we, um, you know, most churches, they have like, they have their, their men's like group and we have that, we have our men's group. Um, but what's something, something we found, um, we're, the Allen Valley is a sort of a commuter city. Um, so a lot of our guys, it's hard to find the moment when we can connect with them. You know, I mean, they're leaving 4 a.m., they're getting back 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, and so what, what we've done is we've created a whole bunch of micro men's groups at our church. Um, and so we have just a, we have a lot of guys who've been in the church for years. And so we just ask guys, hey, um, we want you to lead one of these micro groups. And like, we'll all read like a book together. Um, but then we meet all over the place, different times, different venues, um, all throughout the week. So, so there's something for everyone, you know. Um, so, I mean, even like Sunday morning, some of these guys groups will get together. Um, I do mine Saturday morning. I just have it at my house, have a group of guys. Mm -hmm. Um, we get together. We're like, we're reading a book right now called men of the word. Um, and just going through that. Does everyone read that? I'm I'm asking for a reason because it sounds a little bit like what the Bible study that we do here, um, at the jujitsu Academy where it's, it's more application based. We're not going necessarily through, um, you know, a book out, we're doing a book in the Bible is what we're doing and reading through, you know, various chapters. Um, But that's my heart's vision is to see men all over our town and our community meeting at, you know, Starbucks or Chick-fil-A's or at their homes or here at the jujitsu academies. And, and I believe that, you know, that's how you get men to stay connected. You know, Jesus brought 12 guys around him and discipled them. And that's who he ran with. Yeah. That's where I see these community, these small micro community groups, you know, that's the, the ideal optimal, you know, number of guys, yeah. um, in these little groups. Is that what yours looks like? Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that I try to emphasize to men is, um, it's not, it's not the pastor's job to do the ministry. It's mm. the pastor's job to equip you for the ministry. So what I'm doing, I'm, I'm pouring into you on a Sunday when I'm preaching, I'm pouring into, you know, when we're meeting one-on-one, but I, I'm not pouring into you so you can be a stagnant pond. I'm pouring yeah. into you because you're you're a fountain of living water, and that that water needs to come out of you. That water needs to get on other people. Um, and if you're not if you're not doing that, you're disobeying. Um, like yeah. discipleship is not it's not an option. Jesus doesn't say if you feel led, make disciples. Jesus doesn't say um, if you have the time, make disciples. He commands us make disciples. So if we're not doing that. We're walking in sin and um, the, the men at my church, the men in leadership, you know, we say that we say those hard things. We let men know you're expected to do this. You're expected to disciple mm-hmm. who, who are you supposed to disciple? Well, your family first, you're supposed to wash your wife in the water, the word. So we really challenge our men. You need to be reading scripture with your wife. You need to be reading scripture to your wife. I try to teach them those principles that my dad taught me. Like you're not reading it like, okay, honey, we need to go back to Ephesians five. We need to talk about your submission to me, you know, we need to talk about submitting to me as to Christ. Like you're not reading it at her, you're reading it to her. So you're going to passages and you're, you're reading, you know, like we're, we're a new creation. This is who we are. That what this says that we should be doing in Christ, yeah. this is what we want to do. So we're, you know, you're reading that to your wife, your children, you're going to stand before God one day as a dad. And he's going to say, Hey, I gave you that wife and I gave you those children. Mm. What'd you do with them? Those are your talents. And he expects a return. He expects a return on every single one of those. Um, and that's, that's to the head of the household. That's to the man, you know? So I'll let, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm very frank. Um, that's how I preach. I'm getting a little preachy right now. Sorry about that. But that's how I talk. So that's how I challenge our preach men. It, bro. <laughs> and then, and it's a, awesome because we just have a community of guys here who get that, who take that. Um, they take it home. 
Um, one of the neat things last year, I did this, um, I did this really awkward father son conference conference. Um, you guys probably are familiar with Eric Ludi cause he's out in your area. Um, Eric Ludi runs Ellerslie. Um, but he does, he does a conference called, um, uh, what an honorable manhood. Um, and mm-hmm. basically the whole point of this conference is to get dads talking to their teenage sons about sex, which is like, mm. man, like dads do not like to do that. That's the most awkward thing yeah. in the world. Um, and in our day and age, if you're not talking to your sons about sex, they're going to get some wacky ideas because what the world teaches about sex right now is crazy. Um, and yeah. so we did this conference and how we did it remotely. So we just sort of watched the, we watched the videos, but you see Eric Ludi, he talks about it, but then you sit down with your sons after every session, you have like a, a father's guide and you go through these questions together. And like, as guys, we need that, especially with the sex talk, like going through that with our boys. Um, and it was really cool to see, uh, there's about probably 30 people came to it and fathers, you know, with their sons sitting down, you know, it's just like, bless my heart. As I looked out and I saw like these dads just sitting with their, their sons and talking through how to glorify God with their sexuality. Um, that's so, that's so essential, especially just for our teenage boys. And a, a lot of parents like are, um, both my children's ministry director and my youth pastor here, they're like, we're here as a supplement to what you're doing. Um, we cannot be you. We don't want to take your place. Um, we want to, we want to support you. We want to come alongside you. But at the end of the day, you are the primary discipler of your children. So we just, uh, we've sort of created an environment here um, where we really challenge parents to, to own that. Um, and it's not a, it's not across the board. Um, part, part, a large part of our church is children. Um, and some of those kids come without parents. Um, we have a really effective outreach into our local schools and kids will come to our church, parents drop them off. And, you know, those, those parents obviously are not involved, but, um, the parents who are here, the parents who are involved, we really try to challenge them. Like you're the primary discipler, you're responsible for this. One of the, one of the things that I tell dads, cause as, as guys, the enemy tries to convince us, you can't do that. You don't know what you're doing. And we don't. We don't know what we're doing, but here's the thing. Um, we have a perfect book like that. It just blows me away that not a jot or a tittle of God's law is going to fade away until all has been accomplished. And what that means is like, I can open up scripture and I can read that. And that's the message. Like what, what I have to say, nothing, but God's word does. So just open it and read it to your children. What, what if they ask you a question you don't know the answer to? Awesome. That's an opportunity for you to grow and tell them you don't know the answer to it. That's totally fine. But God's word is what's going to transform your children. Like I love um, the Psalm 19, you know, it starts out with talking about just the glory of creation, how amazing it is. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God, but then you get halfway through and it says the word of God is perfect or the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's what we want as dads, as Christian dads, we want our children's souls to be converted. How is that going to happen? You got to read the word. You got to be in the Mm. word with your children. You got to be in it constantly and consistently needs to be in your head. You know, like I was sharing, my dad just had it on his lips all the time because he was in it all the time. So he's in it for himself, but then he's just reading it to us. So you don't have to like come up with some amazing curriculum. Like when I do, when I do family devotions, we just sit and we read the Bible together. Um, Last year, I challenged the men in my church. I said, guys, if we read five chapters of the new Testament a week, we'll read through the new Testament in one year. And so I challenged all the men. I said, I want you to read through the new Testament with your family this year, just read through it out loud. Um, which meant I had to do it. Right. Um, and it was, I just read it and ask the kids if they had thoughts, if they had questions, mm-hmm. I would ask them questions about it, but we just have a conversation and, um, it wasn't, I didn't write anything out. I didn't prepare anything. I'll just read the chapter and then just talk to them. You know, mm-hmm. that's all yeah. you got to do. It's not real complicated. You know, I, I think that's a great point, Caleb, because, you know, James encourages and exhorts us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Mm. And I was talking to a pastor this morning on a, on a Zoom call um, who's down in Colorado Springs, and he was telling me about, um, you know, the, he's a, involved in marriage ministry. But then he started sharing with me that he's allowed himself to get out of physical shape, right? Mm. And he's been reading all these books on nutrition and fitness. And I said, have you started exercising yet? No, no, no. I'm just doing all this research and research. <laughs> I said, bro, just do something, go out for a walk. And, um, and it's just like what you said with ministry, 
Um, we have to have a willingness to fall short, knowing that we're not going to be perfect, but we need to do something. Yeah. Right. You might not have a, you know, a perfect discipleship plan for your kids, but if you're sharing scripture with them and sharing what God's teaching you through the word, that's a good start. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of when, uh, you remember when J- uh, Jesus sends out the 70 in Luke 10, remember that mm-hmm. he's like, yeah, don't take a money bag with you. Don't take anything, go figure it out, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And if they don't accept you, just, uh, you know, get the dust off your feet and move to another house. It's like, yeah, you've been walking with me long enough, but you need to go out and do now. And be doers of what I've what I've taught you, yeah. And uh, and I think that's an important lesson for us to hear. I think one of the biggest obstacles for men is we we really find our identity in what we do um, mm-hmm. instead of finding it in Christ. You know, that's a temptation. Like what you know, this is just society. But you talk to a guy, what are you going to ask? You'd be like, what do you do? You know, yeah. And it, part of it is like, what else, what else are you going to talk about? But it's because we have a high value on on career on vocation. Um, one, one of the things I challenge the men at my church with is um, you don't provide for your family. That, that sort of shocks them. You know, I say, don't go to work to provide for your family. Don't do that. You don't provide for your family. God does. Now, yeah, if you, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. You're worse than an unbeliever if you're not providing for your family. But how do we provide for a family? Jesus takes a loaf and he takes some fish. He breaks it and he hands it to me as the dad. And then what do I do with that? I share it with my family. That's what provision looks like. I'm depending on him. Um, and we, this is sort of lost after the industrial age because like, mm. well, I put in the hours so I get the paycheck or I do the job so I get the salary. So we see it like as, you know, time in, money out. An agrarian society, they totally understood that they were depending upon the Lord, even though they're sweating, even though they're working. They know at the end of the day, God is the one who provides for me. And I think we sort of lost that as we've sort of moved away from the land a bit. Um, you know, the, the school system, they didn't pay my paycheck. The church doesn't pay my paycheck. God provides food for me. God takes care of my family. And what that means is um, I don't I don't need to hustle more. I don't need to go out. Uh, This is something God's really been convicting me of. Um, I work I work side jobs, you know, to try to make ends meet. Got six family, six kids and single income. Um, And uh, God's just been ministry ministry doesn't pay that well. (laughs) (laughs) It's not great. God's just been convicting me, Caleb. You're not depending on me. Like, don't go get those extra jobs because you're yeah. worried about inflation and, you know, getting gas in your car and all those things. Like, I'll take care of you. You got to trust me. But that's a real worry for a lot of guys, Caleb. I mean, exactly. it really is. I, especially, yeah. you know, I talked to guys just this week, you know, their their fuel costs are double what it, what they were two years ago. Um, right. They go to the grocery store and they're probably paying a third more than what they were paying, you know, a year or two ago. And so now the concern is, well, I, I need to cut back or I need to go you know, get three extra jobs and sacrifice the time that I had with my family. It's yeah. a real concern today. Yeah. And the only way we can conquer it is if our eyes are fixed on the kingdom of heaven, if we're seeking first mm-hmm. the kingdom of heaven, you know, um, because it's, that's a real concern. And what Jesus said, he said, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry that's about right. what you're going to eat. And I mean, that's it, right? Like as a dad, I'm like, well, like my kids got to eat. Um, my wife is amazing with this, by the way. Um, one of the things that we found is uh, I'm, I suck at this. And so she does all of our um, bookkeeping. She pays all the bills and she doesn't show it to me because I have this whole, I have a math brain. Um, and so my <laughs> math brain is like, wait a second. Uh, this is how much money I made. This is how much our grocery costs. It doesn't add up. Um, and we stay out of debt. We don't go into debt at all. We don't spend more than we have. Um, and so if I'm seeing it, I'm doing the math. And that's that's just not a good thing for our family. We figured that out. So she, she takes care of all of it. And she, her attitude is like, eh, God's going to take care of us. And she'll like, she went to a restaurant recently and was buying, um, she was buying lunch for her brother for his birthday and like for our whole family and like cost a lot, you know? Um, and the owner of the restaurant goes to my church and she comes up there and he's like, Hey, don't pay anything. You know, we're going to, we're going to take care of you guys, you know? Um, and just little things like that. Those things constantly happen. And I'm like, Yep. Why am I worrying? Like my father, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. You know, mm-hmm. he's going to give me a hamburger when I need a hamburger. He's going to take care of me, you know? Um, and so his, his provisions are endless. Um, inflation doesn't affect God. And so that's a, mm-hmm. that's, that's my wrestle right now. Um, I'm working, I'm working two side jobs right now in, in addition to being a senior pastor and I've committed to wrapping those up. Um, I'm under contract, so I got to finish. Um, but I'm going to finish those up and not do that anymore. Um, it's it's tricky for me. 
What kind of side work? Um, so I'm an adjunct professor at the local community college. Okay. Um, I it. teach math there. And then I work for a publishing company called Pearson. Um, they make textbooks. And so I create content for them, um, just video content. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's pulled me away from the ministry. Um, the teaching at the college is, is my fishing hole. Like I get opportunities to share the gospel with people in the world there. Um, but something God's been teaching me, because at first I wanted to keep that because I could have a place where I'd still interface with the world. It was, it was weird for me as somebody who was a lay um, minister. Like I worked, I had a job and I was still doing ministry. So like all of a sudden full-time ministry, I'm like, well, wait, wait a second. Where do I fish? You know, where do I find unbelievers? Mm -hmm. Cause I'm at the church, but God's constantly bringing people into our church who need to hear the gospel. So he's like, Hey, you know what? I'll bring the fish. You just trust me. I'll take care of you. Um, so that's been something he's been really convicting me of working on my heart. Um, you don't need to go get the side hustle. Um, let me take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. And you just, you focus on what, what I've called you to do and you do it well. And that's first of all, reading scripture to my wife and discipling my children, you know, um, it's not pastoring the church first. It's, it's yeah. focusing on my family first. If I don't do that, then I'm disqualified. Yeah. One, uh, kind of like jumping off of that, uh, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, uh, me and, you know, my wife, Amy, uh, we went through cause she, a lot of things like happened. She, she ended up getting injured during COVID and she was doing like a lot of side jobs. And, you know, I mean, when we moved from Georgia, Colorado was significantly more expensive and, you know, kind of like I, I struggled with similar things of like paying the bills because when we moved out here from Georgia, you know, the house was double the price. Like this was double the price. This was double the price, you know? And, um, I, I became consumed, um, for a period of time with, obsessing over controlling the finances instead of like what you said, like that God, yeah. God, God, God's providing. It's not me providing it's God providing. Um, and then, uh, the, this, this year, you know, um, we God really put it on our hearts that both kids needed to be homeschooled. And so mm -hmm. that meant Amy needed to be home and she was working full time. albeit she was working from home, but she couldn't, work from home and then be able to focus yeah. her heart and soul on, on our kids. And so we started praying and like, you know, the, the company she was at was very, very extremely on the liberal side with all of the, you know, you read on the news, all the different policies, all the different views on sex mm -hmm. and everything like that, you know, they were pushing everything. Uh, and so she was constantly feeling like a minority in the company, but God kept her in that company for longer than originally um, we thought was going to happen. You know, we kept praying about it and there was no answers, nothing in sight. And then um, God in a conversation opened it up with my boss where he was able to say, hey, um, you're underpaid. Um, we're we're going to give you a bump, um, you know, and then we, we kind of struggled at first because the amount was only going to be about half of what Amy was making. And, you know, we, we had, and then, so we, we had to take a leap, a step in faith out in it. And so we agreed to it and Amy uh, quit her job right at the same time, the same physical therapist who goes to our church was like, Hey, I need a, an assistant physical therapist in my hour and my hours would be very, very flexible. And like where she could like pick up a couple like little hours here and there. And then, you know, I mean, at, at, and then, so she's able to be home a majority of the time with the kids, but then she can pop out for an hour or two um, in the evening or early morning and like help out on the physical therapy front. And so um, I got, God just provided, you know, that open window where she's able to focus on the kids. And so, you know, and like a lot of that was just by just trusting God. And cause like, we didn't like a couple months ago, we didn't even know we were going to be here right now. So. Hey, Caleb, let me ask you a question. So, <laughs> You know, you, you're doing these side jobs. You're obviously discipling your family. You're pastoring um, a church. And that's a lot on the plate, obviously. And um, I was talking again to this pastor this morning, um, and I had told him this study that I had done. That, well, Song and I had done this exercise, and you're a math guy, so you might appreciate this. So we had a spreadsheet, and for a week, we tracked our time, how much time we actually spent with one another. Mm -hmm. And I told him I was horrified to learn that after a week with my wife, I'd only spent 20 minutes of quality time with her. This is a few years back. Mm. I was horrified. And, uh, and that was, you know, just 
how much I was spending time uh, um, pouring into her. You know, it wasn't like having dinner together, you know, just the, it was how much time were we spending investing in one another? And, and it was scary. Mm. Right. So how, how, how do you, um, how do you know what, when that danger point comes up that you're not doing the things that you need to be doing? So, you know, for guys that, you know, put their head down and go, I just need to grade those papers or I need to finish this one project. And that one project, you know, is never the last project, you know, they're going to do it again and again. So yeah. do, you, do you have guys around you that pour into you or um, do you track that yourself? Yeah. Um, I have, I have a men's group that I meet with. Um, and my best friend is a part of that. And he's somebody that, um, that pours into me, um, encourages me. I have men on staff here too, who, who will, who will challenge me, you know? Um, but the, I have a unique relationship with my wife. She'll let me know. Um, you know, um, and like it, it, she let me know a lot when we were first married and I was very just career oriented and distracted. Um, we have, uh, we have twins, um, and our third pregnancy was twins. So we had, um, we had our first daughter, um, and she was four years old when the twins were born. Our second daughter was two and then we had twins. So we had four kids, four and under. Um, and so when my wife got pregnant with twins, she let me know, um, Hey, I need you. You need to be here. You need to be present. Um, and I just made some commitments at that point. And, um, I'm just sort of like, a am a creature of habit. Um, like once I, once I create a habit, it's really easy for me. I, I love doing the same things over. I can eat the same food. I can do the same me exercise. Too. <laughs> like, that's me just, too. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Right. Yes. Um, and so we've just created some rhythms in our life, um, that have built that built those quality times, those times for connections into our life. And we both can tell, um, when, when, when life gets chaotic and we have to push those things aside, it's not good. It's not good for us. So we really try to, we try to maintain that consistency. Um, I'm, I'm a guy who sort of lives by my schedule. Um, my wife is very spontaneous. Um, and so what we do is we, we try to, um, we just plan it. Um, so we built in a time every single week. That's our time together. That is a built in no is what I call. So I have a built in no in my calendar. Anybody says, Hey, can you, I have a no in my calendar. I can't say yes, because that's my time with my wife. Um, mm. so for us, that's, that's Tuesday morning. Um, we get up, we walk together. Um, we, we wake up every morning and we pray first thing in the morning, just the two of us together. Um, but on Tuesday we go for a prayer walk, um, which is something my parents sort of modeled for me. Your brain's more active when you're walking and praying together. Um, and so we'll just spend, we'll just spend a couple hours every single Tuesday, um, walking, praying. We stop at a local coffee shop and we visit and have coffee together. And, um, on the way out, we pray on the way back on our walk, we just sort of catch up, we visit. Um, and so I have those built in my schedule. I have times, um, with every single one of my children built into my schedule, um, where every week I'll take one of them out and just spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. So once a week, one of my kids gets to go out with me. And so it's a, it's a six week rotation. So six weeks later, I'm going to be able to spend time with that child again, um, just to spend direct time with them. Um, and then I, I pray with my sons every night, um, before they go to bed and something I I'm task oriented, right? So I'm I like, I love the schedule, but because I'm task oriented, I used to go into my son's room and, um, and I'd be like, they'd be talking and I'd be like, okay, guys, it's time to pray. You know, we need to pray. And I realized my sons want to connect with me. Like, why am I like, stop talking to me. It's time to pray, you know? Um, mm. and so what I did, I got an overstuffed chair, put it in their room and let's go sit in the chair. And it's, and I'm present. Like before I was like sort of standing next to their bunk bed and, you know, just sort of like shifted my weight and like, okay. Getting frustrated. <laughs> like, yeah. come on, we need come to do on, this. You know, you got, Cause you know what happens, you know, they turn yeah. into uh, philosophers who are dying of thirst before they go to bed. <laughs> exactly. at night. Um, but I was like, you know, this, this is quality time. This is good yes. time. And I'm going to miss out on this. So just put that chair in there. And I sit every night, I sit in their room with them and just, we just visit, you know? Um, and it's mm. just the three of us men in the house, everybody else is girls, you know? So that's sort of our guy time that we have, um, every, every night, every night we do that. And my sons are 13 now and they won't go to bed until I come in. Like they're 13 year old men and they come and they're like, dad, we're tired. We need to go to sleep. Come pray with us. You know? Um, cause I, I have a household that's like grand central station. We have people in our home constantly. Um, and so, you know, they'll come and grab me and, and I'll go and I'll, you know, leave and just sort of 
spend some time in the back with them. And something I, I realized too is like, um, we do a lot of ministry in our home. And what part of the reason I do that is I want people to see me like, hey, you know what? Uh, just a second, I'm going to go pray with my sons, you know? And then they see me go and they just see me disappear for a while and come back. That's teaching them something about the father heart of God. And I can try to preach that, but it's yep. so much more effective if I incarnate that, you know? And then if I, if, if my wife and I haven't had a chance to connect and we have people over, I don't have a problem sitting on the couch with my wife and visiting with her. Um, that's okay. And that's good. That's healthy. It's good for people to see. Yep. I'm totally in love with my wife and I want to spend some time with her. I want to talk to her. Um, and so those are, those are practices that well, one of the things that God showed me, cause I do have a busy schedule and a crazy life is you can do it all. Like you, it can overlap, you know? Um, and that's hard for me cause I'm task oriented. So I've had to learn to have the both and in my life where like I can connect with my sons and disciple other men at the same time. That's okay. That can work. Um, and so I've, I've figured out how to sort of create that, that overlap, um, in my life where I can have people in my home, but also have time for my family. Uh, one of the things that God's been convicting me of re recently is we'll have families over for dinner. And when we have other families over, we don't do our regular family worship. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? We should just do family worship with another family when they're here. Let's just, you know, um, all sit together, you know, and we'll just read scripture and they'll get to see like how we do it. And, you know, that'll be cool. And I haven't, I haven't done that. I'm like sometimes sort of distracted because we have company over and I'm, I was convicted recently. That's something I need to start doing. So you guys can hold me accountable yeah. to that. There nice. it is. Hey, what does it look like when you travel? How do you keep your schedule when you travel? A lot of, you know, guys listening in, obviously yeah. travel. Jared, you know, is uh, picking up his travel now in the coming weeks. Yeah. And so how do you, how do you keep, you know, I'm very task oriented like you do. My wife is actually, she gets impressed with, I don't know how you just stay on task. And I'm like, well, I mean, cause I build the time in. Because we yeah. have a you know busy jujitsu academy, we have the podcast, we have our other business that we run. So my time is is very valuable. But I make yeah. time for just like you do the kids. I date my kids, date my wife, um, and make sure that I take time for myself to stay you know healthy and active, so I can show up um, and not distracted when I'm when I'm meeting with them. So how you know what does it look like when you travel? When when something out of the ordinary you know from your normal schedule starts to happen. Yeah. Um, so it sort of depends on the kind of travel. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to speak at a conference, um, I, I try to do all my, all my prep work for that conference beforehand. Um, and I try to, I, I have other people who are doing ministry here at the church, so I can really just sort of be present at the conference. Um, but one of the things that I do, um, if, if I'm asked to speak somewhere, um, as I require them to bring along one of my family members, so I'll bring along one of my kids or I'll bring my wife with me um, so that I'm, I'm doing that ministry still in the context of my family. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'm not really um, in that in that context. I still I still have my system. Um, I'm a runner. I get up. I run in the morning. I read scripture. I pray with my wife. Um, and so when I go, I just keep doing the same thing. Um, so I, I maintain all of those practices. Um, but then all just the other things in my in my life, I try to I, I try to take care of all of those things. So I can just be present with where I'm at. And part of that is because I, I found I can't, I'm not a good multitasker. Um, so um, if I'm speaking at a conference and then I'm going to preach at my church that weekend, that's like my brain short circuits. I can't handle it. Um, and so if I'm speaking at a conference, I ask one of my other guys here to, to preach for me um, just that it works better. But like when I go, when I travel like family vacation, um, I really like to travel places where there's no internet like no cell service, no internet. Um, so like nobody can text me, nobody can email me. I can just totally unplug. Um, like I love the mountains. I love just to get away in the mountains. We have a, a family at our church who has a cabin, um, at a local Christian camp called Hume Lake. Um, and they give us that once a year. So we just go away. And, uh, oh man, I look forward to that so much cause it's just, it's mm. unplugged time and it's all nice. together as a family unplugging. And that's just, it's so important to do that, to have that, have those times that you just, disconnect. I took my, um, I took my staff here at the church, um, just on a prayer retreat on Monday. We just went up in the mountains and we spent half the day just in prayer as the staff just got out of the office, just left the church behind, you know? Um, and that's something I try to really teach the people that I'm discipling is like, um, you're, you're only as effective as your prayer life. Um, and, and if you're too busy, um, to pray, then what you're doing is pointless. 
It's no, mm. there's no point in it. It's a waste. You're wasting your life. Um, you need to, you need to be diligent to be going to the Lord in prayer and to just drop everything. Um, my, my youngest brother, um, 25 years old and he's a prayer warrior. He puts me to shame. Um, but it's, it's so refreshing because they'll be like, Hey bro, let's, let's go, let's go hike and pray together, you know, and we'll just go up in the mountains and just pray for just hours, the two of us, you know, and, uh, it's such a, such an important reminder. So those are the, those are the habits I really try to maintain, um, when I'm, when I'm traveling, um, just keep those up. Um, and, and it's interesting because like, um, the physical discipline plays into those things, you know, the Uh physical discipline of waking up in the morning and going for a run, it wakes my brain up. It gets me ready for the day. Um, it prepares me for the day. Um, I, I think I shared with you guys before, like, uh, God really convicted me. I like to, I like to run, um, marathons. I've done triathlons, things like that. Um, and I really like, I like to push myself. I like to see, you know, how far can I actually go? Um, I like to find that, that extra gear when I don't feel like I can. Um, and God really convicted me. You need to bring that home. You need to bring that home with you. And then what yes. do I mean by that is I'd get home and I'd be exhausted and I'd feel like I don't have any energy left for my family. And God was like, really, you can run 20 miles, hit the wall and then run six yes. more in a marathon, but you can't come home and be friendly to your wife and play with your kids. You're pathetic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's the word God used in my head. Right. Um, and it was a super convicting, like get your act together. Like if you can, you can discipline your body that profits a little, you know, but you need to take it to the next level. You need to bring that into your spiritual life. And it found like just mentally, I'm literally going to the same place in my head. I go to in a marathon, like when I'm exhausted at the end of the day and I feel like I can't, I'm like, no, Hey, I push through. I can do this. God can give me the strength yeah. to do this. So and he does, he teaches me how to, how to discipline my body and make it my slave. And that's a, that's a great word of encouragement. Very convicting. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, for me it is, and I, I'm sure for a lot of guys that are listening, but I agree with you. I think that physical discipline and pushing through barriers has helped me also come to the point where I could say, I can, I can make time for that for sure yeah. if it's for my family or, you know, I could stay up or, you know, we've, um, we found this new ice cream place in town, Jared called Andy's it's a custard place. Okay. And so, uh, we made a late night run the other night and I wanted to go to bed. Yeah. You know, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big sweet eating guy, but you know, the kids were all excited about it. And I'm like, yeah, why not? Let's go. It's like 10 o'clock and we're making a run to the, <laughs> to the custard place. But it was, you know, it was spontaneous and it was mm-hmm. fun and uh, we had good discussions. And obviously, um, you know, I gulped down a, a big thing of custard before going to bed, which is never good for the next morning, <laughs> but it was, it was good. But I, you know, I could have made every thing. excuse to say, I don't have time. I have to wake up at 4 a.m. tomorrow. You know, I have things to do. But, uh, but it was important to them and it was fun and spontaneous. And it's something that I think they're going to remember. I hope. Yeah, you know? definitely. So, Hey, you, uh, you also talked to, uh, we're, you know, we're coming up on time and we do this thing called final thoughts, but you, you talked a lot about, you know, God giving us this command, uh, to be leaders, have dominion, um, over things there, you know, there was a, a leadership pass off basically from God to us. Um, and, and it's a command to men. Um, that, that you were pretty passionate about when we talked the last time. You want to speak mm-hmm. into that for the final thought, or did you have something else that yeah. the Lord has kind of put on I your mean, heart? When when God when God put um, Adam in the in the garden, He gave him yeah. directions for creation. Um, he gave him directions to to watch over it, to tend it, to take care of it, to nurture it. Um, that's why we're here. That's what we're designed for. And you know, one of the one of the things that God taught me, um, like I felt a call to ministry. And then I worked 18 years in a, in a quote unquote, you know, secular job. And I realized like all work is worship. All work is worship when you're Amen. reflecting your creator, when you're bringing order into the world, um, when you're glorifying God with your talents. Um, and, and it's, it's so important as, as men that we recognize that what we're doing is for the Lord and that we do it as unto the Lord. And so, you know, it's, it's so important to be discipling our children and to be reading scripture to our wife. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, at the end of the day that you're not, not doing good work. Um, like uh, as Christians, we should stand out in the workplace. Um, we should be, um, we should be above reproach in the workplace, but also we, sh- we should be the most effective worker, um, because we have Christ in us. I mean, we have supernatural strength sustaining us and, and it's, it's so important. I think it's easy to, to think like this work doesn't matter. Um, and it does. And it, even unseen work, you know, God would convict me like you're just sitting here grading papers. What does it matter? 
you're doing it as unto me, you know? So mm-hmm. as you're eating or you're drinking or whatever you do, you do it heartily as unto the Lord. And so what you're, what God has given you to do matters and do it for him, do it recognizing this is for him. I'm not doing it for an earthly boss. I used to get um, really convicted if my principal would walk in my classroom and I'd bring my A game. I'd be like, you know what? No, I need to, I need to be just as consistent when he's, when his eyes are on me as when they're off of me. Um, and I, I just challenge you guys who are listening to this, do the same thing, you know, like no matter who's watching, God is watching. That's who you're working for. God's the one who pays your paycheck. God's the one who provides for you. And so whatever you do, you do it as, as unto him, you glorify him. And here's the crazy thing. Like if you do that, well, God gives you opportunities to share the gospel. Get, people are like, what? what makes you tick? Like what's going on with you? You know, like talks about in Peter, you know, always be ready to have an answer for the hope that you have. Why are people asking about hope? Because they see you're wired differently. They see that your work ethic is different. Like, why do you even care? Nobody's going to even see that. Why do you want to do a good job with that? Well, because I have a hope that's beyond and I'm working for somebody who's unseen and you get opportunities um, for the gospel in your work, in your workspace. If you're just working as under the Lord, you're seeking to please him and honor him. And like, the thing is like, think about how we feel as dads when we see our kids just doing a good job Man, that pleases us. And that's, yes. that's what we're working for. We're working for that. Um, you know, Max Lucado calls it the applause of heaven, that, that day when we're going to stand and he's going to say, well done. That's what we want. That's glory. Yeah. That's what it means to be glorified is have God look at us and say, well done. You did a, you did a good job, son. You did a good job. Um, and, and here's the thing, like <laughs> we're kids, right. And we're going to not do a great job, but that think of the grace that you have for your children. You know, you're not going to be like, this is shoddy work. You could do so much better. <laughs> like, what is yes. this? You know, it's just like, oh man, it's yeah. such a blessing to me that you're trying, that you're trying to do something for me. That's, yeah. so, that's so special, you know, and you're going to, you're going to affirm that and you're going to celebrate that. And that's our heavenly father. He's better yeah. than us at that. And that's, that's what we get to look forward to. So so important to just keep that, keep that in mind, keep that internal, that eternal perspective, seek first the kingdom. Yeah. You know, one of, you know, our, our four pillars are honor, integrity, strength, and grace. And, uh, and it reminded me of when you just spoke to those, you know, to those things of, of being graceful the first time my son mowed the lawn. (laughs) <laughs> right. Have, you haven't had that experience yet, have you, Caleb? I have. I have a writing. Uh, okay. Mower. <laughs> yeah. So I think I have a video. So, so I remember, yeah, I remember. I remember Caleb first mowing the grass, and I wanted to freak out in the worst way, right? Because yeah, I don't want to say that I'm anal about it, but it's just like I just, you know, it's a little OCD ish, you know, with with that stuff, and yeah. it was all messed up, and and I just went, okay, Lord, <laughs> I got to train him better. <laughs> You know, yeah. so does, like, hey, buddy, they need glasses. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, and so, but you know, he's he's a master now. But it's yeah. uh, but it, you know, it's you know, you have to take those steps, and you know, and 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 it's a good lesson in working on to the Lord. So you know, mm-hmm. thank you for for that uh, for that word of exhortation and uh, and a reminder, you know, to, to yeah. us as men that we're not working on to man, we're working on to the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But, uh, but thank you, Jared, do you have anything you want to say anything to your friend that, uh, we're going to probably have him on again for oh, yeah. sure. Well, we'll yeah. have him on and we've got more stories and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I didn't uh, even get to the, the bachelor no, party. Story. No, you didn't. Right? So <laughs> that's a and great I, story. I, yeah. I think it's important just also like, um, I'm an optimistic person and I really do a good job of sort of forgetting about what's behind, but everything I'm sharing, I'm not perfect that, you know, I've definitely had my share of panic attacks. I've had my times where I'm just like stressed out up to my eyeballs and I'm like, how is this going to come together? But every time God comes through. And so every time my faith grows, so I'm, I'm not perfect in this. Um, and so I just want, I want guys to know that he's, he's using somebody who's, who's imperfect. He's using somebody who struggles. Um, but th- this is, this is the one thing I do. I forget about what lies behind and I press on toward what lies ahead. You know, like, Man, I got a lot of scraped knees. I, I've tripped over a lot of things, but every time I get knocked down, I get up. And that's what's key. It's key. Like, mm. not where you, where, you know, are you within this sort of parameter of like, this is righteousness and you live inside of there? No, it's like, are you running towards Jesus? And when yes. you trip, you get back up and keep on running towards Jesus. And that's, yeah. that's what it's all about. And so, wherever yeah. you're at in that journey, what's important is find Jesus, get your eyes on him, run to him, keep running, yep. don't stop, get up again when you trip keep going. He forgives you. Forget about what lies behind. Press on to what lies ahead. So that's the key. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's I, I agree. I, guys are either running to or running from God. Yeah. Yep. Those are the, yep. the two places. Yeah. I mean, it's your trajectory. Um, the, yeah. That, that reminds me, Caleb, of uh, that uh, mountain biking uh, accident that you were in and you, <laughs> you got knocked out and had a concussion. And, you know, a, a lot of men would have just given up and like quit doing those type of activities like, oh, that's too dangerous. But, you know, like we're, our, our, we're at war, you know, spiritually. And so like if we move into like wartime tactics, you know, um, the enemy's always attacking us. Satan's always trying to trip us up, yeah. you know, and if we have that spiritual bicycle accident, you know, do you just throw in the towel and just give up with the concussions too hard, too difficult? Or do you go fix the bike and yep. get back on it? Get back in the fight. Yeah. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, All right. Good talking to you. And, uh, and yeah. we're, we're prayerful that this, uh, this podcast, this first remote, you're the first remote podcast. What's first this remote. episode 25? <laughs> yes. Jared? Yes. Episode 25. I'm, first remote podcast. I'm glad to be your guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> More than that, bro. Yes. It was yeah. good seeing you. Absolutely. Caleb. Yeah. Thank you guys. It's a blessing. Right, love you, bro. Thanks Talk for later. coming on. All right, thank you. All, All right. right. Gentlemen, thank you again for listening to and supporting the Uncommon Disciple podcast. Be sure to visit our website, OncommonDisciple.com, and download the 12 attributes of godly men. And while you're on the internet, go ahead and run over to YouTube, like, and subscribe to our channel. On our channel on YouTube, we're going to have a lot of bonus content, a lot of uh, videos and behind the scenes, so you don't want to miss out on that. And if uh, you've enjoyed the content and uh, what we've put out here with our guests, give us a follow on Instagram or Facebook, and, and you won't miss any of the announcement or events that we have coming up. So be brave, be courageous, be uncommon.